Have you been wanting to lose weight and get healthy? Now is the perfect time to start Nutrisystem. Enjoy your favorite foods made healthier, delivered free to your door. Right now, you can get Uniquely Yours Ultimate, our most complete, foolproof plan, at an amazing price. Order today and save 50%, plus get an extra $40 off. Go to Nutrisystem.com slash save and discover what millions of people already know. Nutrisystem works. Limitations apply. See website for full offer details. Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. Here to talk about an interesting topic today, the Ravens passing game. Been on everybody's mind. Very hot topic on Twitter and all through free agency. I'm sure it'll, it'll maintain that way through the draft because, hey, it is every year. The skill positions are always the positions people want to talk about. Here to talk to me about the Ravens passing game is Zach Blewett. Zach, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Ken. Thanks for having me. All right. Now, people uh, can find you on Twitter. You're fairly active uh, at Raven Ravens. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, I use Twitter mostly to follow news, get updates real time and tend to tweet and comment when I get fired up on a particular game or topic. (laughs) Yeah. It's very easy to pick out people who really know football from things they say on Twitter, because a lot of Twitter is non-measured comments, but there are a lot of other people who really try and say, but if that were true, then this wouldn't be true kind of thing. And I, I, I immediately, I saw that in Zach and I, and I, I said, well, this is somebody we want to have on a short. Uh, anybody who out there wants to be very easy to get on very quick, Zach, how long did this entire turnaround take for us? Oh, I sent you a message this afternoon and we had it planned within an hour and here we are, here we are. 10 p.m. <laughs> ready to roll. 3, 325, uh, we're recording this. Things may change, although this will be out fairly quickly uh, uh, next few days anyway. But uh, but things always may change on the free agency front in the in the meantime. So I think we, we there's a lot of material you sent me in a very brief time. I really appreciate that, Zach. Uh, I normally ask for like three bullet points to have a 15 minute discussion or something. I immediately saw from the material you sent me, this is going to be a longer discussion. So we're going to break this up into two podcasts. And the first one is the where are we now of the Ravens passing game. So why don't you start us down that track and and I'll kind of ask questions as you go. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I, I got a little bit fired up about this topic. I, I, we've been, been seeing a lot on Twitter, um, even the major news agencies, they're all sort of reporting on the Ravens inability is how it's it's being uh, sort of framed, inability to land a receiver. And uh, I just think that that's not really the most fair characterization. I think that there are a lot of things in motion. And I think uh, one of the most important pieces to consider that the national media tends not to is really that offensive philosophy of the Ravens. Um, you know, you've talked about it on this show a lot. A um, bunch of other shows uh, talk about it. But, you know, it's really all about controlling the clock for the Ravens. Um, and, you know, we can, we could talk about how Greg Roman has performed over time. Um, you know, whether that is the right type of offensive fit for Lamar, all those questions out there, you know, you're going to have your naysayers. Um, but the fact remains that the organization as a whole is dedicated to that sort of ball control philosophy and uh, the decisions that they make, especially in free agency and in the draft, really reflect, reflect that philosophy. Right. So, I mean, the Ravens are very unusual, certainly from other mm-hmm. teams, in that they break all the offensive rules in terms of generating positive expected points, say, from the run game. And by the way, that's very hard to ferret out. I hate expected points models because they don't really do a good job of reflecting expected wins, particularly in the second half. So you, you often are, are left with, with a, quite a shortcoming there. But, you know, it, the second half of most NFL games are played with one team trying to control the pace and say, let's get this, let's get this game the hell over with. And the other team saying, no, we need to keep, continue it as long as possible and try and catch up. Right. So, yeah. uh, you know, it, expected points are not the greatest way to do it. But the Ravens are that very rare team which can run the ball effectively on almost any down and in particular on early downs and do better than any other team running the ball, but also almost any other team passing the ball additionally on those downs. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, trying to dictate the pacing of the game early on in the game is is a a real strength of the Ravens. And, you know, we, we, 
hear all the time that they live and die by the run. And if they get behind, they're never going to be able to mount a comeback. And I just don't really see that as the issue that a lot of people make that out to be. Um, yeah, it's a, it, you know, a great point there is that the point is made that Lamar Jackson's only 10 point comeback in his entire career was the playoff game at Tennessee. Never had another one. Well, Jackson's hardly ever been behind by 10 points. The Ravens run <laughs> out to a halftime lead and, and they never give it up. I mean, that's their, that's their, their philosophy, if you will have it, is to score more points more earlier than the other team. Yep, and to, to knock Lamar for not putting them in a position to be down by that much, you know, a lot of the best quarterbacks in the league, they have those comebacks because they dig themselves that hole mm-hmm. early, uh, whether it be a couple interceptions, um, fumbles, turnovers, whatever the case. Uh, but Lamar just doesn't do that. You know, he's, he's super efficient. Um, he really handles the ball well, you know, maybe past those first six, eight games as a rookie and, and the fumbling issues, he solved those. And, uh, yeah, I just don't think it's a fair knock on, on the Ravens to, to talk about them within that sort of frame of not being able to mount a comeback and that they don't have a passing game that can compete. Right. I mean, they don't have a passing game that can compete, I think, was proven very fallacious in 2019. Whether or not you want to say the National Football League caught up to Lamar Jackson in 2020 is another matter. But in 2019, he had 36 touchdowns, six interceptions. The Ravens passing game was at the top and the running game was also at the top, which gave them a historic offense in terms of of what they actually produced. Uh, It's just hard for me to buy into that argument a year later when the Ravens dropped to ninth in points per drive, I believe it, I believe it was ninth um, that, that from looking at those two years together, that they would not be judged to be still an excellent offense as they stand and as they're constituted right now. And that's a big part of what I, what I think that um, people are blowing the wide receiver thing out of proportion. Um, you know, when you're running this sort of ball control offense, Um, You know, we talked a little about time of possession being critical, running the ball is critical, winning in the trenches is critical. And if you really boil it down, I think that uh, in terms of the offense, that wide receivers are probably the least important position for that type of strategy. Not to say that they're not important, they are. But, you know, if, if you're making hard choices, which every GM in the NFL is right now, you can sign a Kevin Zeitler for a fair deal, um, or you can go out and, and try to chase down your Kenny Galladay's. Great, great point, because I've made the point a number of times on this show that the hard part about being an NFL GM isn't deciding to spend money on every single position. The hard part is deciding where you're not going to spend money, where you're going to intentionally economize and cut short, and you think you can still win despite it. And the Ravens of the early 2000s, you know, they built a great defense and they didn't expend a lot of resources on offense. This Ravens unit is tremendously blessed at a lot of young offensive players, a very cheap but historically efficient offense. And yet they're spending a lot of money on defense right now. That's going to have to, you know, a lot of that's going to have to change. But as that occurs, DaCosta and the rest of the front office are going to have to decide, where am I not going to spend money? And there's several positions out there that the analytics community would tell you are good ones not to spend at. Sure. And I think in a couple of ways, the Ravens sort of eschew those, that analytics, right? You know, we value running backs. Uh, you know, we, we value some of those positions that maybe teams don't, but we're also trying to do some things that most teams are different, you know? Um, and you might even be seeing a, a, a shift here early in free agency, uh, a little closer towards the Ravens way. I mean, you see the Patriots signing two top flight tight ends, um, You know, the way that the Browns have sort of repositioned themselves to be, you know, a lot more 12 personnel. Um, You know, I don't want to say that the Ravens were trendsetters. These aren't new concepts in in football, but certainly they sort of said, all right, the rest of the league can be this heavy passing attack. We're going to try to take a different approach uh, and capitalize on that on that difference. Yeah, they, they're they're very different because they can go all the way from twenty two or twenty one personnel. Twenty two is probably the you know the the heaviest you get really mm-hmm. uh, to thirteen 
and show so many different looks out of that and threaten you in so many ways on the field that don't require a wide receiver to be part of that threat other than oftentimes as a run blocker. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, skipping ahead here, I think that a lot of people really, you know, we live in the world of fantasy football, especially on Twitter, mm-hmm. right? You know, they, people just don't value that element of the game that wide receivers bring. Um, and so really, you know, I think, you know, hopefully in, in this session, we could talk about that philosophy a little bit more. Um, and then I, I really want to dig in, like, what do we already have? You know, what, what do we, what pieces of this offensive philosophy do we already have? And what type of receiver is a good fit for the Ravens? Because I really does think that it comes down to finding the right fit at the right price in order to, you know, not only for a wide receiver to be successful uh, in our scheme, but also to be happy in our scheme. Right. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, yeah, lots of interesting stuff there you said that could be unpacked, but I'm going to let you unpack some of it one, one point at a time. So why don't we start, go back to what you said before, which was what do we have already in terms of where are the Ravens now? Because that's really what we're trying to make this podcast about. And mm-hmm. we'll kind of finish it up in the, in the second portion of this when we get a chance to record that. Sure. So I think where we are right now is we have, uh, and again, all in terms of, you know, framing within the passing game here, uh, we have an elite tight end in Mark Andrews and what I'll call an elite, maybe some people would want to call burgeoning player uh, running back in JK Dobbins. And I think uh, that having that nucleus, uh, you know, those electric players, in addition to Lamar, um, Really, you know, that should be the focus of the passing game, the tight ends um, and expanding on on the role of the running back. Um, I think you can see from 2019 to 2020, the areas in which we took a step back, especially in terms of efficiency, um, how that really correlates to the, um, the loss of Hayden Hurst, not having a real second weapon at tight end uh, behind Mark Andrews. And so I think that, you know, the, well, as far as what we have right now in the passing game, we're, we're doing the right things at, we're, we're all set at running back. I think we can all agree there. Now they might draft somebody if they really love them. They have Tyson Williams, you know, waiting in the wings as a UDFA. And, but I think that the tight end uh, can definitely be improved. Yeah, and I would agree with the tight end. Let's come back to that in a second. With running back, what the Ravens have been so successful at doing in recent years is coming up with a player who's a stylistic fit. And you mentioned Tyson Williams is in the wings. Running backs get hurt. I mean, they take a pounding during the year. They miss games, not irregularly. Okay, so you know to expect that Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins are going to be able to get through the season on skate, I think is probably unrealistic. I, I, I don't think – I think there's more than a 50% chance – that they miss, say, three combined games between the two of them, okay, for the season. Yeah, I would say that that's definitely fair. Um, you know, but then, you know, throw in Justice Hill, a, a, a third-year player who I think they want to get more involved. Um, you know, I think that we proved last year that the four-headed monster might have been one too many heads to, uh, <laughs> you know, really maximize that running back room. Um, but, you know, you're right. I mean, we, we should be considering the depth for, for even the running back position at this point. And, and honestly, the running back is a size and shape position is fairly easy to fill. A lot of great athletes played running back in high school. And there's a lot more athletes who are in that six feet, two and a quarter kind of range with good speed than there are offensive tackles who are six, eight with 35 inch arms, for example. So it's, it's, a, it's a much easier position to fill from a size and shape position. There's also, there's a fair number of different stylistic qualities they have when you just see the difference between even Gus Edwards and Dobbins. They can still both be effective in various areas, but they run the ball very differently. They do. You know, it's uh, in a lot of ways, it's sort of that classic thunder and lightning, uh, you know, tag team between the two of them. Um, and I think, you know, what again, what I would really like to see is an expansion on the passing game, 
with the running backs. You know, there, there was some moderate success there last year. Um, but even, even in, uh, 2019 only, I, I looked it up earlier. I think that it was about 12% of the target share went to running backs mm-hmm. and about 13 in 2020. So I think that that's an area that, you know, you've gone out, you've, you've invested a second round pick in JK Dobbins, uh, you know, maximize his skill set within this passing game, get him the ball um, and, you know, let him make those electric plays. You know, it's interesting because uh, Gus Edwards has been remarkably successful as a receiver, too. And it's it's kind of gone under the radar. It's on an efficiency basis, of course, but he's caught 18 of 22 balls thrown to him. All four of the ones that he did not catch were last year. But his career yards per target is... Let me see, make sure I have this correct, is almost 10 yards per play, about 9.8 yards per target for his entire career. There aren't any receivers in Ravens history who have been as good. I mean, obviously, I'm not, I'm not going to project 22 targets out to a normal <laughs> receiving workload, even for a full year. But I'm just saying that, that there's more value there as a receiver that is largely a function of scheme. I mean, we saw last year some ability for, for Edwards to get free even between level two and level three. Very unusual for a running back in the Ravens scheme. Oh, I think one of my favorite uh, passing plays last year was that shot down the, the right sideline to Edwards. Uh, you know, the, those defenders were not ready to try to take down a player of his size along the boundary and they made him pay for it, you know? Um, yeah. So that was, that was a, a, that was a shorter pass. It was maybe 10 yards and he, he got past a couple of, mm-hmm. of tacklers. How about the one down the middle of field last three weeks or so with a season deep down the middle, 30 yards ish. I want to say, uh, I have to go back to it and look at the game logs and make sure I have the correct play. And I'm not, you know, thinking of something that didn't happen, but I'll look for his long catch of the season. Cause that's going to be it. Uh, uh, okay. I'll, I'll look at it. You please continue on with your next point. I'm sorry to, to sure. block you off on Edwards here. <laughs> no worries. Um, so I, I guess the main point there is I do think that there is an opportunity to expand the passing game within the running back room, whether it's Dobbins, Edwards, obviously Hill has some of that ability. Um, you know, that is an opportunity for Roman to, you know, get a little bit more creative, I think, in, in the way that you, you get some of those quick hitters. Um, you know, if we're moving on to tight ends um you know like i said we have an elite player in mark andrews he is lamar's go-to guy nothing's going to change that at this point he's either going to lead the team in targets or be very close to it i think he was second to hollywood by a little bit this year Mm -hmm. um but you know he's the safety blanket um and boyle when he's healthy uh is a reliable pass catcher i think a lot of people don't value that um quite as highly as his blocking, uh, which is easy when he is the best blocking tight end in the NFL. Um, but he's made some pretty clutch catches. He, he makes himself open to Lamar when plays break down. Um, so he is a great 1B uh, in the Ravens tight end offense. Um, but I think that they're missing that second pass catching tight end element and you saw that in a pretty steep drop off drop off in tight end targets from 2019 to 2020 Mm -hmm. Uh, so you know i'm looking for the ravens i think that they you know going into 2020 they thought they would use pat ricard a lot in in more of a tight end role which they did to some extent um but maybe not as much as as we were we were thinking that they might um i think that they need to go out and get a true pass catching tight end and you already see them starting to make some of those moves uh, the, the offense was certainly very efficient down the stretch uh they played you know some weaker defenses but they played some weaker teams in general in those last five games when they thoroughly dominated but the um, uh, one thing that really showed up was the Ravens didn't quite know what to do with the extra tight end position slot that was not there. So they, they tried Matt Skura a lot as a sixth offensive lineman. They tried Bredesen some as a sixth offensive lineman. They had Tom Linnison in there, but they never had him go out for any targets to speak of. I think he might have had one target on the year. Uh, you know, they had Wilson in there for a while after Boyle got hurt. Uh, he didn't do much uh, in either catches or total targets. So, you know, 
They really had a, a little bit of difficulty figuring out what to do. The entrepreneurial spirit is resilient, and U.S. Bank is here to make sure that no matter what unknown pops up, business owners know that we have their back. Because problem solvers are the ones that keep us all moving forward by finding ways to close gaps, even when distances are being kept everywhere. So whatever you need to adapt and evolve your business, U.S. Bank is here to support you. U.S. Bank. We'll get there together. Equal housing lender member FDIC. With that extra eligible receiver that they hadn't tried to fig- needed to figure out when they had Boyle on the team. And I think a, a couple more names that you didn't mention, uh, Jacob Breland, I think they were pretty high on him, uh, being able to get him as an undrafted free agent. And then obviously he landed on IR for the full season, never got on the field. Um, and I think that there's still some upside with um, uh, Wolf, Eli Wolf, yeah. Wolf, I think, Eli Wolf. Um, you know, he was not, uh, you know, he was not uber productive in college and in, in terms of catches, but the athleticism is there. Uh, the speed is there. And, um, you know, obviously they saw something enough to, to keep him around. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he even got a couple snaps, uh, in a game or two. Um, I don't think Wolf was active. I could be wrong, but I, I just do not know. But I remember he, he also landed on IR um, at some point in the season. So the cupboard is not bare in terms of tight end. And then we also have the trade that they just executed uh, just last mm-hmm. week um, for the tight end from the Jaguars, Josh Oliver, uh, who is sort of one of those analytical outliers. Um, you know, we hear all the time that Eric DaCosta loves analytics and they're, you know, the Ravens are incorporating that more and more into their not only their game plan, but their team building game plan. Um, and it seems as though Oliver is one of those sort of outliers in terms of size, speed, production. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm excited to see if we can get anything out of him after a couple of years that were played by injury in Jacksonville. Yeah, it was an ex- it was exciting acquisition as you can be for a young player who's effectively used the first two years of his four-year declining option value. Uh, not producing much, but he's just four days past his 24th birthday. I mean, you, you, ha- you still have the possibility to create a meaningful linkage to the Baltimore Ravens that, that might be very good for him. And, you know, tight ends and, and the ability to play 13 personnel has been so significant here. And the ability of Jackson to create mismatches against zone defense and in particular to make linebackers bite on play action if you're not excited about coming here as a wide receiver, which is something we're going to talk about, you should be very excited to come to Baltimore as a tight yes. end. Your, your, your snaps are going to be maximized relative to your position on the depth chart and your opportunities, I think, also maximized. I totally agree with that. And I do also think that, you know, the, that move in particular caught a lot of hate on Twitter from Ravens fans or, you know, at least people that want to comment on <laughs> what the Ravens are doing. And, uh, you know, they, they sort of made it sound like, well, if you're doing this, then you're not also trying to land a wide receiver or you're not trying to find that edge rusher. And these things are all moving at once for the front office. You know, they, they need to maximize all these opportunities. And just because they do this move first, it has no bearing on whether they're going to go after or sign another player. Especially a cost like this, which has almost no cost to it, a, a move like this, which has almost no cost to it. It, it. it would, I cannot create that linkage. But what I think I'm hearing on Twitter is that people, because it's the same every year, frankly, people get upset with the Ravens because they're not making a move in the early days of free agency when the, when the stars are available and you know that's just not the Ravens' way. First of all, they have comp picks to protect. But second of all, um, you know, there's, they just believe there's better value in the players who were left over after people have overpaid. Absolutely. Um, you know, maybe this is getting a little bit more into where we want to go with the Ravens. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I see these people pounding the table for a wide receiver. You know, we we have to get a wide receiver. I, I've even read some things and heard some things that, you know, just sign somebody, just sign yep. somebody. <laughs> what, what a what a what a bad sentiment. What a what a poor approach to team building. That it, it, if you you know you have to make a move, or otherwise you're not doing anything. You know, sometimes waiting 
is the move that you're trying to make. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's, you know, truly what the Ravens do most years. Um, I think maybe a little bit more glaringly this year, since we're very much in the spotlight, you know, with Lamar being such a, uh, a lightning rod of both praise and criticism. Um, but I think, you know, a lot, people want to see him succeed for the most part. Uh, you know, the, the right people have the best intentions for Lamar and they want to see him surrounded with players that will give him the best opportunity opportunity to succeed. Um, I just think that saying just sign somebody is uh, <laughs> not the way to get him to succeed. So many phrases which go along with that because we have to do something. We'll never beat the Chiefs. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things about never beating the Chiefs is that it's not going to happen until it happens, for starters. And second of all, it's the biggest ask of all. In fact, the playoffs are the next biggest ask of all. The biggest, biggest ask of all is beating the Chiefs because they're the best team in the AFC, in my, in my belief. Maybe that might not be true anymore, by the way, with the way they've been reconstituted this year, but it certainly has been true the last three years. So if, if, you're, if your only ask is the biggest ask, well, you're setting your sights a little bit too high, frankly. The Ravens are into the game of getting in that tournament every year. And that goes back to a point that you've made in, in previous weeks on, on this podcast is ask the question, is it a is it a complete failure mm -hmm. if you don't get to the Super Bowl if you don't or win, win the Super Bowl? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even even you know win it, and you know I, I think the obvious answer is no, right? It's not a failure if you don't win the Super Bowl every year. There's 32 teams in the league that you know are are trying to trying to get there and doing everything that they can to get there, and I, I think that the Ravens have had a lot more success than the majority of franchises out there. And it's, it's an unreasonable bar to set to say Super Bowl or bust. Very unreasonable. And let me, let me take people through a journey. And I'm going to ask Zach these questions, but I want you to answer these questions. Answer these questions for yourself when you do this. Did you grow up a fan of the Baltimore Orioles? Yes. Or, okay. So since approximately what year do you identify yourself as a fan? You're much younger than me, but, but I, I, you know, I, go, I go back to an area where the Orioles were consistently successful every year. Yeah, I was a little bit after that. I mean, I, I would, I, you know, was starting to really, you know, back in Little League in, in the 90s is, is when I was really getting into baseball. So you, you basically are a Camden Yards era Orioles fan. Yes. Okay. And so the 92, 93 teams, in fact, the 92, we're going to say the 97 teams all gave you your money's worth in terms of being contenders, being there, having a great new ballpark, doing everything. And then from 98 till whenever, till, till the Renaissance really years in, in uh, the Machado <laughs> years, they were terrible and they were terrible every year. And then, then during the Machado years, they didn't make the world series. And they, you know, most notably didn't make it in 2014 when we, we all thought they'd win it all. Yes. But uh, I definitely don't look at the 2012 to 16 Orioles and say, that was an abject failure, even though they had only three playoff appearances. We were, we were starved for a long time, and I can only come to the conclusion that we're very spoiled as Ravens fans in a relative sense. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think of those years of the Orioles as a failure at all. Um, in fact, I, I don't really think of any year for, you know, for the Orioles as a failure. They have a good organization. Uh, you know, they were going through a transition period right now. I think that they made some contractual mistakes and it was hard to dig out of. And that's going to be true for any team. So, you know, I think that they're doing the right things to, to get back on track. It just takes time. And it's a little bit different than the NFL in a lot of ways with, you know, not really the same type of structure in terms of, of, of a salary cap. Mm -hmm. uh, team building is just so, so much, you know, more protracted. Um, you know, it's just very different. Right. So you don't you, you make a good point because they don't really have the option to say, well, I can either contend every year or I can put all, push all my chips in the pot this year like the NFL does. The NFL allows for a system of what I call roller coaster parity, where you can be very high and then you can you can take you can purge and go very low and then go back high. So that's that's a philosophy of organization management that doesn't isn't the one chosen by the Ravens. And I believe is not one I would want as a fan. I don't want 
a team to basically have years that they say, well, we're, we're writing this one off because we've made other choices to try and make a run at the Super Bowl, particularly if it didn't work out. You know, I just, I, I don't want sure. that. Right. And I don't think that any real fan of any team wants that. You no, know? I, no, you know, no. They... We, we, so much on Twitter. I'm sorry. I don't, I, I told you, <laughs> one of the things we don't do is they're like, it is, but we, we've seen enough on Twitter in the last month to know that there's plenty of people who are, and, and I think some very smart people who are willing to say, yes, I think you need to be willing to, to push more chips in the pot when it's time to push more chips in the pot. I, that's true. I mean, th there, there are a lot of people out there um, that say that. I think that um, th some teams have had success doing that. I mean, look at the Buccaneers, right? They thought they were in a good position that they could take their roster. And if they added a Tom Brady, now granted, they added a bunch of other pieces as well, mm -hmm. um, major pieces, um, but they sort of did make that turnaround in, in, in one season. Um, but I would say that, you know, that's that's not very typical. The teams that try to make that push, it, it doesn't work very often. Yeah, oftentimes it doesn't. The Rams are going through a lot of the pains right now of having an overpriced roster and and others, uh, you know, are, are in that same boat too. the Saints, obviously, with the end of the Breeze era. I can see going in at the end of Drew Breeze's career on trying to win it because they're going to have to develop a new quarterback anyway. So I kind of get you know, the notion of let's give it one more shot right now. Sure. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles and the way they've been managed, I think has been uh, uh, to play the roller coaster rather than play the consistent eye. Uh, well, I, I'll tell you what, I, I like first round picks. So if I'm a Rams fan, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not very thrilled by, by what's going on uh, with, with building that team like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, for most teams, that first round pick represents about 60% of your total value in the draft. 60%. The Rams haven't had a first round pick or, or will extend their streak to, I believe, seven years from 16 to 22, I think are the, are the periods where they won't have a first round pick. That's an absurd period of time to be playing with 40% of the draft capital everybody else is playing with. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So outstanding stuff in terms of where we are now. Are there any other points you want, we want to talk about right now that maybe don't go to the wide receiver position directly, because we'll talk about that in the next show, that are, are worth it on the setup for the Ravens here? Well, I, I think it's just worth pointing out that um, there are some things that, that people want to see the Ravens do, um, take more big shots, uh, use play action to get those big shots. Um, they want they want a playmaker. That's the word you hear thrown around. People, you know, mm -hmm. players that, that are making plays, making something happen, doing something electric. Um, and maybe it's just because we don't necessarily have somebody that is that true wide receiver one, whatever that really means to people. Mm -hmm. um, but people seem to forget that we have those electric elite playmakers um, just at different positions. And, um, you know, we could talk more about Hollywood on, on the next edition and um, you know, what he, what I think he brings to the table, but a lot of those big chunk plays, those electric plays are going to Mark Andrews. Um, there were several to Hayden Hurst before he departed. Um, and all of those types of plays only work when you're staying on schedule and sticking to this ball control philosophy, um, giving yourself the opportunity to take some of those shots at the right times. And we don't want to get away from that. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you make the point staying on schedule, you mean from a down and distance perspective that you're that you're. You, you're creating good conversion opportunities, which still allow you to take chances occasionally that you would like to take. The number of my tweets that mention that Greg Roman should run on first down directly reflect that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the interesting things about the Ravens taking deep shots is they don't always result in a deep shot pass, which I think bothers some people. But, you know, a lot of the Ravens' big run plays are zone scheme or sometimes a man scheme where the play breaks down over time, coverage breaks down over time with an extended pocket created by Jackson, and then an escape from that pocket, which can go 20 or 30 yards. And I, that's a lot of the Ravens' big plays. In fact, you look at the, at the you know, the, the comparison between his scramble yards and his sack yards, and you realize just how special this situation is that, that it creates leg opportunities 
as frequently or more as it does great long pass opportunities. That's definitely true. I think you see that at least once or twice a game. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that, you know, part of staying on schedule, doing the ball control thing is you're, you're showing them that you can smash them in the mouth, right? That you can pound the rock and they run the same play until you can't, until you can stop them basically. And what that does is it gets the defense keyed in on looking for specific things so that when you do make just a slight change, mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to bust a coverage, um, break a run you know, make those big plays that are not just all predicated on chucking it deep. Right. But they're, you know, it's not, it, the first option is not your only option. So you're, you're, you show them the same kind of scheme you've been running for many plays so that they can identify quickly. And the linebackers often will make a mistake. I did three plays looked at. Now these are handpicked plays. So I'm not trying to say this, this identifies a trend, but it definitely identifies anecdotally what can happen with Jackson back there is that the defense runs it out, runs itself out of so many plays against the Ravens. It's, it's, it's very frequent. In fact, is frequent in terms of the big plays, I think that it happens. Uh, so we, we looked at the long touchdown run against the Eagles, might have been about 50 yards. But, you know, Orlando Brown does exactly what he does on, you know, 75% of the run plays where he, where he down blocks on that left defensive tackle, moves up half a level to try and block someone at level two, and everybody has scattered to the four wins. Nobody's where they're supposed to be. Jackson takes off. You know, Brown doesn't even have a block to make, and, and, and it's an easy score. Uh, you know, so many of those plays, we saw the Van Der Esch in the Cowboys game, you know, taking very much the, the uh, extreme uh, move to, to cover. I think it would have, would have been Dobbins. Not sure who it was that would have been headed left on the run. I don't know if you remember or, or not, but it left a big hole, obviously, up the middle. So, yeah, yeah I, I think when you have a player like Jackson back there, gap discipline becomes a lot harder for those middle of the field defenders. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it creates additional opportunities for the big play, and it, it's not always the passing game. Yeah, very much, very much strains the defense in a lot of ways. Okay, outstanding stuff uh, here, Zach. Well, let's let's t in the next episode we're going to get specifically to the wide receivers, and we're going to talk about a few things. One is what type of wide receiver would really be a good pickup for the Ravens, given how the rest of their offense is constituted. What could help them the most? Uh, you know, what's out there in free agency? What would make sense in terms of options, in terms of when they might go after such a wide receiver? Uh, what else you got on, on, on those terms that would be covered in the next episode? Uh, definitely want to take a look at, you know, the, the two main possibilities here are free agency or the draft. Um, you know, we don't necessarily need to get into specific players that we like in the draft, but just, again, sort of identifying that good fit, what kind of roles would really allow Lamar to take the next step as a passer. and um, you know, just sort of all of the different moving parts, because there are so many considerations in both free agency and the draft. Um, you know, they're working on a on a tight cap this year. And you know, I think a lot of it, it just comes down to timing and being patient. And, you know, feel free to pound on the on the table on Twitter as much as you like. You're not going to change Eric DaCosta's mind on on their game plan. Very good. Outstanding to have you, Zach. Excellent discussion. Love talking to people who really know their football. Uh, one more time, where can people find you on Twitter? You can find me at Raven Ravens, R-A-V-I-N Ravens. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been great to chat with you, and I'm looking forward to picking up on part two tomorrow. All right. Me too. Uh, if you're also someone else out there who'd like to get on a film study short, please just send me some bullet points or a short email, uh, filmstudy21 at verizon.net, or hit me up on Twitter at filmstudyravens with your idea, and we'll get back to recording it pretty quickly. This is a nice kind of a lull time. There are additional lulls that happen before training camp. Lots of opportunity to talk football and get your view that you're really passionate about on the air. And I, I can tell from, from Zach's presentation here and the amount of material he sent me in advance, he's, he's extremely passionate about this. and We're lucky to have him on. Zach, thanks again for coming on. Thanks a lot, Ken. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you next time on Film Study. <laughs> Thank you.